Hungry Dad. Welcome to Hungry Dad, your guided tour through the delicate and often overwhelming balancing act between food indulgences and social acceptance. And now, as always, here are your hosts, Rod Budget and Hugh Gallon. Hello and welcome to episode 47 of Hungry Dads. I'm Rod Budget. I'm Hugh Gallen. Hello, hello. And tonight we have a very special guest. Dutch Portley has joined us. He is an ad marketing guru, a fan of the show, somebody we know from our ad days who has listened steadfastly to the podcast and is going to be here to provide a lot of insight and industry insider information. We talk a lot about advertising on the show, a lot about marketing, and this guy has been in the trenches. He's going to give us some good behind-the-scenes insights. Before we get started, I think Hugh is going to chime in. Welcome, Dutch. Good to have you. Hey, thanks a lot. So uh, before we start talking to Dutch, and I cannot wait to hear what he has to share, I have one quick anecdote that I wanted to to share with everybody. If you recall, it's way back in Episode 5, you shared party tips, some children's party tips tips for for the hungry dad for maximizing your food at a kid's party yeah i remember that and and i and i think the show's message is getting out there i think we're permeating the conscious because at at, at a party that uh, was actually for my daughter last weekend somebody executed your move and i don't tell me somebody don't know it wasn't the intentional spill was it the intentional spill no. was, was executed Uh, And I tend to believe that this person heard about it on this podcast. Three and a half year old Kara licked off about two thirds of her cupcake icing and then dropped it on the ground, which fully entitled her to a new cupcake. So Kara, three and a half years old, if you're listening, thanks for being a fan. Thanks for executing the Rod Budget. A classic tactic of eat some, drop it, get get some more. Uh, Really good tactic. Really well played. I don't think anyone but me recognized it for what it was. Hungry Dad. We will not be quiet. We will not try to blend in. Disappear in the background. Play second fiddle. When we're in a sandwich, a salad, a panini or crostini, you'll know it. We're not like the others. We won't ever try to be. We are our own mixed up blend of one of a kind spices. We are Miracle Whip, and we will not tone it down. I could see my company doing that very Miracle Whip ad or something very similar to it and feeling like they were revolutionizing something like kitty litter or um, chips, something real important. So here's the problem as I see it, Dutch. Let me know if I'm wrong. I think there are these product managers and marketing officers who spend their entire lives dealing with Miracle Whip or kitty litter or potato chips. And to them, it it really is the most important thing in the world. And they're so blinded to the outside world that something like the Miracle Whip ad can happen. And they think, yes. Believe me, that's that's absolutely true. Because, and even at uh, Carnival, I mean, company that I work for, (laughs) There's some buyers that uh, they think of themselves as real important, and I've actually seen titles of people like Senior VP of Cat Treats. <laughs> <laughs> you know, or maybe like uh, Executive Vice President of Male Incontinence. <laughs> <laughs> One of the funniest meetings I was ever in, and this is a 100% true Dutch Portly original story. Um, I was in a meeting with the buyers who buy caulk, K C A U L K, caulk, <laughs> like like the uh, construction material. Yeah, like that. And so I go into this meeting, and uh, one of my buddies is across the table from me, and we're sort of looking at each other like Beavis and Butthead. And uh, these people are like, this one guy starts the meeting, and he's like, "All right, guys, we need to sell some caulk." <laughs> I'm this is like, a Wayne's World sketch. I mean, this is like, unbelievable. Let me tell you something. I've been, uh, I sell more cock than any place <laughs> here. I am a, my, what you might call me a cock master. I'm a <laughs> cock professional, you know. Let me tell you something. I move a lot of cock. <laughs> Completely oblivious. And he just kept going on and on. And I was just like staring across the room at my friend. And we were just like about to lose it. Because the guy didn't even realize what he was saying. Yeah, when you're in that business, you got to let the air out of the room before you go into that conversation. Hungry Dad. Dutch, why don't you just tell our audience a little bit about how you got into the ad industry, what you think of the ad industry, and maybe some of the more noteworthy food business that you have been a part of. I got started 
back in the uh, 1990s, I went to college. Somehow I got into a decent state university by cheating on my SATs. <laughs> and uh, I ended up in advertising. I kind of worked my way through most of the A's. I flunked out of architecture and astronomy <laughs> and uh, got into advertising. Anyway, I uh, became a copywriter, and I started doing that. Um, so just briefly explain to our listeners out there what a copywriter does from a day-to-day basis. What are you doing? Well, I've actually changed my title myself because I'm a copywriter, but I tell people I'm a copy suggester. <laughs> because what that really means is that um, I suggest what I think the words on any ad should be. And then lawyers and uh, all kinds of managers and everybody that cl- and all different kinds of buyers and everybody sort of comes in and tells me what they think the word should be. Then they always win. So that's what it ends up being. I suggest what the word should be. And, and then, then they tear it apart. Then they totally change it. But I'm glad that I sort of had that first round so I could show them exactly what they hate. I feel like I'm somehow triggering the creative genius that's really within all of them who aren't copywriters. <laughs> so, yeah, I think people think of the ad industry as this glamorous kind of Melrose Place type of business, being a copywriter, madman. It's very glamorous in Hollywood, but you're telling us that it's not the all that it's cut out to be. Well, um, I've never had sex with anyone on my desk or anything like that those <laughs> place. Um, I work in a cubicle that's got burlap on the sides that's got about 30 years of farts. Ooh, in it. burlap. <laughs> and Ooh la la. It's a lot, it's kind of like off the movie office space in a lot of ways, only the characters are just as annoying, only not, there's no comedic value really to what they do. <laughs> so while we're on offices, That reminds me, we've talked in the past about eating in the office, eating lunch in the office. What's your lunch scene there, Dutch? Are a lot of people eating in their cubes? Do you eat in your cubes, or do you run out and get food and bring it back, or do you go out to eat? There's a lot of people that eat there. I I have to get out of there for my lunch break because I go nuts. You know, I'll I'll usually go somewhere really fancy like Arby's because on a copywriting salary, I uh, can afford to, you know, enjoy the finer things in life. Maybe Chick-fil-A. Well, it's two different ends of the fast food spectrum right there. You have a very respected Chick-fil-A that is beloved and Arby's, which is just completely trashed by almost everyone. But you're you're an Arby's supporter. I know that. I feel like I'm a very complex man, and uh, so I also I went to Burger King today, and uh, <laughs> you know I've got a very broad palate. Now Arby's, we've talked about this in the show too. Uh, as I, I as I know you're aware, Dutch is one of our biggest fans. You know Arby's gets a bad rap. Generally, it's been the butt of jokes on The Simpsons. It's been the butt of jokes on uh, The Daily Show. A couple questions. Number one, do you think it's warranted? Is Arby's as bad as they say? And number two, you know, Arby's has kind of leaned into that, uh, especially with recently on The Daily Show. I don't know if you're aware of that. They they advertised on the last show. What do you think? Is, is Arby's smart to kind of own that ridicule, or should they just ignore it? I've sort of got two thoughts on Arby's. Uh, one of them is, yeah, it's a little. their meat is a little weird. It's got bubbles in it. And I don't know uh, any other kind of meat on the planet that has bubbles in it. We've mentioned the Arby's bubbles Um, before, I think, believe it or not. It's sort of, it's some kind of, I think it's made of some sort of meat-like paste that they slice thinly. That being said, it tastes good. And that's really all that matters. It tastes good, so I eat it. To call it barbecue is a joke. (laughs) But, um, you know, I think they... It tastes good, yeah. It's kind of like those weirdos that get all excited about the McRib coming back every year. There's a certain group of people that'll eat anything. I'm one of those people, by the way. From an advertising perspective, I would guess, and I'm just guessing here, that Arby's is a very male-skewing uh, fast food chain. The women are all going to be at your Chick-fil-A's and maybe at your Wendy's getting a salad, and the guys are going to be at Arby's. So, yeah, do you think Arby's, I guess the finale of The Daily Show, they... The Daily Show, historically, Jon Stewart just ripped on Arby's like throughout its entire tenure. So in the last episode, Arby's kind of embraced that and, you know, said, ha ha. What do you think about that advertising strategy of kind of admitting that a lot of people think you suck? It's dangerous, but do you think it's worth it? 
I actually think it's pretty smart. I think it's good. It makes you likable when you don't take yourself too seriously. And uh, the evil, imp- I mean, uh, company that I work for, they sort of take themselves too seriously, and as a result, nobody likes them. I think it's funny, and, and it's endearing when a company makes fun of itself and doesn't take itself too seriously, particularly if it's in a very not-life-and-death type of a business, like fast food or a, a very lighthearted thing. It's like, why not have a little bit of fun with that? I mean, you wouldn't want to do that if you were like a funeral home or something. <laughs> I don't know. I'll, I'll tell you a good example of, along the same lines as the uh, the company I work for. Well, let's just say that there's a uh, a website out there. Let's say that my company is called uh, Hallmark. <laughs> let's just say that it's called Hallmark, and there's a website out there called The People of Hallmark. Mm. Yes. And uh, let's just say that I think it'd be really funny if we did something to sort of embrace that and actually had fun with that and made some ads about the people of Hallmark. Yeah, I kind of agree that it's good and a brand can have some personality and laugh at itself. And So Dutch, what are some of your favorite fast food ad campaigns or just food campaigns or restaurant campaigns that you can think of just off the top of your head? I kind of like the ones that combine fast food with some kind of terrifying, nightmarish, uh, sort of Salvador Dali type imagery. <laughs> and what I, th- what I think of what comes to mind is the Burger King with the huge plastic head. <laughs> that's that's uh, where I thought you were going with that. You know, it's really only one thing that could have been. Clearly there was uh, some creatives that were sitting around smoking weed or something, and they uh, decided to dream that crazy thing up. It's great because you sell burgers, but it also inspires nightmares. <laughs> do, you, do, you, do you think that that was an absolute mistake, or did the quirkiness lead somewhere with, with, with a core audience? I think a lot of people talk about how funny it is and how creepy it is, but um, it had kind of a retro nostalgic feel to it. So, you know, I, I kind of liked it personally, but I don't know. Yeah, I think it was appealing to their core audience of kind of young dudes who, like, think it's just kind of crazy and funny. And You know, I think uh, Subway took it a little far by, uh, you know, having a pedophile character. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, they had a character who's like, ha ha, he's a pedophile, you know. <laughs> that's edgy. Yeah, it's a little too edgy were, for him. Yeah, they were pushing the, the uh, envelope a little bit with that. I don't know. Uh, a lot of people just didn't think that was funny. <laughs> Hungry Dads. We mentioned Burger King. Uh, Dutch, I don't know if you saw recently in the news the, the McWhopper. And uh, I had just seen the headline McWhopper and didn't actually know much more about it until uh, last episode where, where, where Rod told me about it. But apparently the premise was is that Burger King kind of called out McDonald's with this idea of let's have a – let's support World Peace Day or Peace One Day uh, by – Coming together and creating the McWhopper. So it wasn't just this idea of, you know, kind of mashing them together, but it was kind of this unannounced call out, uh, you know, street s- street fight call out uh, between Burger King and McDonald's. Are you familiar with the McWhopper scenario? No, but I, that sounds like a really beautiful thing. So what happened was this is Burger King set up a website, uh, put uh, full page ads in newspapers, basically uh, an open letter to McDonald's from Burger King. Dear McDonald's, uh, we're engaged in this fast food "quote unquote" war. Let's put our uh, warring ways aside for you know one special day that happens to be uh, Peace One Day, which is a separate organization, a, a real organization that seeks peace. And they said, let's create one mashup store where we sell the McWhopper. It'll be in Atlanta, Georgia, which is midway between our home base and your home base. And we'll do it in the name of peace and we'll do it in support and awareness of peace one day and this organization. And, you know, what do you say, McDonald's? Let us know. And it, so it very much put McDonald's on the spot, you know, under the guise of being, you know, friendly. It, it, it came off as a little aggressive, especially because it was unannounced. So Mac, what McDonald's ended up doing is that they responded with a tweet that I, I read it a couple times and I think they thought they were being clever, but it came off snarky. It basically said, uh, Dear Burger King, nice idea, but maybe we could do something truly meaningful rather than this silly idea you're having. Uh, I'm paraphrasing, obviously. 
because because let's face it, you can't compare burger wars to real war. Uh, how dare you do that? Uh, P.S. Just give us a call next time. So it was very condescending, and I think it tried to put them back in their place. But boy, I think McDonald's ca- still came off bad. Maybe just because they're the big guy in the room. Yeah. Uh, tell me what this thing is called—a tweet you just mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> I think you hire a bird to deliver a letter of some kind. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I've, uh, they've been telling me at work I need to learn some of this lingo, you know. <laughs> uh, but uh, Well, a full-page ad is a thing in a newspaper. Yeah. And newspapers are these things that apparently people read to get information oh, from. I don't know. Well, you know, it seems to me like the uh, that's an interesting thing with Burger King. I would imagine Burger King's probably a smaller company than McDonald's. So they've got a lot more to, to win by something like that. But McDonald's fell into their trap it sounds like yeah I, I mean i think it's open to interpretation if you read both messages you can definitely pick up either way i mean the funny thing is is i think mcdonald's you know i think they tried to they had a couple things working against them there they just did this whole big love campaign where you know a big part of their campaign was like having two kind of opposing parties coming together for in the name of love and then they got called out on their own concept basically chose not to not to go along with it it was you know they're the big guy in the room and they didn't want to look weak to to burger king but at the end of the day i think they could have used the mcwhopper i think it would have gotten good buzz for both companies it certainly would have gotten my attention i always thought ronald was kind of a snob yeah, I think this is indicative of that. You know what's a fast food place that I really think would be uh, good for us to talk about would be Long John Silver's. <laughs> yeah. Does Long John Silver still exist? Is it? Are they still around? There is one, and it's not far from me. And uh, <laughs> I'll tell you, it's I don't know how a place like that keeps from burning down like every day. It's just like... Uh, Battered fish drops into a deep fryer. Yeah. So for, for the uninitiated, uh, Long John Silver's is a, is a seafood fast food place, right? Is it is it fair to compare it to Red Lobster? Um, I'd say that would be unfair to Red Lobster. Yeah. <laughs> Not so, that I'm a huge Red Lobster fan, but Long John is like your your fried cod, your fried clams. I think they have some sort of shrimp offering, but I don't know if it's real shrimp or not. That's you got some fish that's shaped like a diamond. <laughs> that they deep fry. I don't know. I've never seen a fish in the ocean that was shaped like a diamond. But uh, <laughs> and then you got uh, hush puppy. Everything's so fried that it's just like if the there's any tiny little sliver of fish in there, it's just incidental. It's basically fried yeah. So you, you come for the batter. I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're they're really known for the little crispy things. I don't know what those are like. With your fish, there'll be these like crispy pieces it's of just pure fried. I mean, it's, it's fried, 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 fried. Yeah, which they taste amazing, by the way. But. Yeah, that actually sounds pretty great. I would just, I would just order that uh, if I could, but I guess you got to get some fish with it. Hemophiliac. I would think that'd be a great cure for them because it would just clog your arteries instantly when you eat it. <laughs> Just keep eating. Dutch, did you go to med school? What this is this is pure inspiration that you're coming up with here. So Dutch, I think it's safe to say that you are the only guest we've had who has recently returned from Tahiti. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Basically, uh I decided to use my four oh one K money and uh just, you know, kind of blow it all and just go have some fun. Tell me about the food scene in Tahiti because it's obviously isolated. Are there American establishments there at all? Is there a specialty dish for well, Tahiti? I'm assuming well, a lot of seafood. There were some McDonald's's on... Uh, wow, McDonald's has made it to Tahiti, huh? On the island of Tahiti. The island of Tahiti is like the biggest... I was in the Society Islands, and the island of Tahiti was the... Uh, the biggest island, and there's a, you know, Papiete is there. That's kind of like the Honolulu of the South Pacific. And there was uh, several McDonald's there, but I didn't see any other fast food. Answer there, me this, Dutch Portly. Did you eat McDonald's while you were in Tahiti? Oh, hell yeah. You know, I liked it. <laughs> what did you get, out of curiosity? I'm picturing, got- you, I'm picturing you sitting on a McDonald's, at, like, with a beach view. And what are well, you eat? I got coffee, because I love their coffee. And uh, I got a lot of McDonald's coffee. They had some weird stuff on the menu. Like, they had some little breakfast sandwich that I ordered. 
And it was just like a grilled cheese. It was just like a bun with cheese on it. And I was like, wow, <laughs> that's awesome. It's like a... Uh, Vegetarian it's burger. It's like a meatless bacon, egg, and cheese. <laughs> Breakfast sandwich. Mm-hmm. Hold the bacon, egg, and cheese. Mm-hmm. So I think I only have one more question, Dutch, and I think it's kind of a softball, and I'm interested to get your take. What is the absolute worst commercial or food advertising that you can think of or you have ever seen, aside from Subway using a pedophile as their spokesperson? It can be a local place. It can be a national campaign. It can be famous. It can be obscure. But is there anything out there that's just, like, terrible in your mind? If it's not food, like, just in general, like... What's well, a campaign that drives you? Well, first. I don't know if you guys uh, know this. You know, I'm actually calling in from Arkansas, so you know yes. I've been a big fan of your your national show for a long time. And uh, you know, the Razorbacks are real big in Arkansas. We are on the national internet. Yeah, yes. that's right. I didn't know how that worked. I thought it was all the way across so, state state lines. So. Um, they have all the businesses around here are called Razorback something, Razor whatever. And I think one of the dumbest businesses that's around here is actually a, uh, you know, like braces for your kids. Mm-hmm. There's a place called Razor Braces. Oh, jeez. And so the first thing I want to associate with my mouth is razor blades. <laughs> yeah, it just sounds... I'm picturing, like, a cartoon of, like, a kid with blood coming out of his mouth. Yeah, and they're called Razor. It's not Razorback Dentist Office. It's right. Razor Braces. It's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. The dentist was probably like, Razorback's too long of a word. Let's just make it Razor. <laughs> yeah, well, it's it, Razor sounds like one of those buzzwords that sounds like it would be cool in the same way that, like, the word extreme is kind of yeah. cool. But not, but exactly not cool. Yeah. Uh, so if you, I'm doing razor, or it, should, it may as well be laser braces. Yeah. yeah. Or knife, sharp knife braces. <laughs> we'll make your mouth bleed. <laughs> yeah, there's some, there's some bad, you know. There's the Olive Garden ad. Well, there's another one where I gotta ask you: Are those, are those? Kitchy for kitchy's sake? Are they trying to be tongue in cheek, uh, or were they shooting for genuine sentimentality and just coming off ridiculous? I, when I, they I, say I uh, when it. they say in here your family, <laughs> yeah, they're trying to convince people that uh, you know over in Italy everyone's sitting down to some Olive Garden breadsticks. <laughs> we talked about the Miracle Whip ad. We, uh, we're talking about Olive Garden, and we're we're agree. And I think we're kind of saying, well, they were trying to be real there, but they missed the mark. But just to make sure we're not completely crazy, let me just throw out Mentos commercials. Those are, are very self aware, right? They knew that they were being kitschy and silly. Yeah, those are so lame that they're trying. It's almost like they look like something that would be really cool in another country, maybe. Right, they were. They seemed European, which they might have been, but they would. I think they hit the right note of being just the right amount of ridiculous, where they were funny, and you were pretty sure whoever created it was self-aware. Yeah. And I and the and the Miracle Whip ad seems so close to that, but not quite. Yeah, the Mentos looked like it was maybe something you'd see in another country by the cats that love David Hasselhoff, you know, or uh, right. something like that, or maybe in Japan, you know, like they think, wow, that's like the ultimate coolness. That Miracle Whip thing, that's... I'm sort of leaning to this side. I, I'm sort of... I, I really think they were trying to be cool, and they were just so clueless that they didn't realize that mayonnaise... You know, it's... They're not... Um, they're not selling skydiving. They're selling, you know, mayonnaise. Yeah. Well, it's... You know, Rod and I bounced it back and forth for quite a while in, in one episode, but the, the reason I'm tending to... to believe you Dutch is because I have every reason to believe that you have first hand experience with ridiculous clients. Oh yeah. And definitely. um you seem to be able to fathom the complete cluelessness of someone calling for that message. Definitely. I used to work in Arizona at an ad agency and there was a guy that had a furniture store that would do a full page uh newspaper ad every week and we would do his ad for him at our agency just to sort of humor him. And uh, it was one of these ads where he demanded that the page be covered with like eighty-five little cut-out uh, recliners, <laughs> like all on the, and then like uh, his picture. He had to be in every ad. You know, he was kind of a, it was really a fun assignment because this art director lady that I worked with, we would sit there 
and we would intentionally make it as cheesy as possible. And we, I would, we'd try to work words in like plush <laughs> and um, hide words in the corner of the page. Oh, I actually worked. Um, I actually worked with an art director um, in Phoenix who actually hid a cat looking in the window on one of our ads. We had a it was a a print ad for a home builder, and it showed this really beautiful living room. And you had to soup. You had to just totally be looking at it in just the right way with like a magnifying glass. But there's like a cat looking in the corner of the window. (laughs) That's great. He actually he actually got that. You know, it went all the way to print. Hungry Dads. Visit our website at HungryDads.com. Follow us on Twitter at Hungry underscore Dads. This has been a Hungry Dads production. So uh, is this going to appear, uh, where is this going to appear? Like on cable access TV? <laughs> sure, why not? We're ubiquitous. We're iTunes. We're, cr- we're on the, cross the platform. YouTube and uh, cable community access. Will it be on my internet? <laughs>